Hello, everyone, and welcome to another related conversation that helps practice the WHW share all the resources of personnel. That's a great question, and I would direct them to the Thinking outside the box, trying to come up with ways of moving. As you already mentioned, let's try to keep these numbers from double. First, I want to say thank you for inviting me to the show. Good afternoon, Harrisburg, and welcome. It is Friday, October 30th, and you're here on Facebook Live for another communi community conversation with me, Eric Pappenfuss. Thanks for being here. Today, we are going to discuss youth programming in the city of Harrisburg, how it is adapting and been challenged by the current uh, coronavirus pandemic. And we are joined by three terrific guests. We have Amy Rote, who is the interim CEO and vice president of programming for Big Brothers and Big Sisters of the Capital Region. We are also joined by Jamie and Harvey, the executive director of the Camp Curtain YMCA, and Patricia Robinson, CEO of Evolve Training and Development LLC. Looking forward to our conversation with each of you, but we're gonna begin, first of all, with some general announcements. And I wanted to start this morning, or this afternoon, with perhaps the most sobering, and that is the latest information that we're getting from the monitoring of our wastewater. In partnership with Capital Region Water, as you know, we're evaluating the virus concentration in the wastewater through a company called BioBot. And each week, I've been reporting on this data, and we've got a graph we want to show you, which, which clearly demonstrates where we are and why people are saying we are having a new spike here in the fall. If you look at that graph, you'll see that we are at the highest level that we've been really since uh, all the way back in the middle of the summer, and that's not good. If you see how it has crept up steadily from September all the way through October and into November and is indeed peaking uh, right now, that's why they call it a spike if you look at it on that graph. Now, what that concentration means is, uh, in, according to their analysis, that we've got about 40 five people a day contracting the virus in the Harrisburg area. And when you think about how easy it is to spread, especially how easy it is to spread as more and more of us are indoors due to the colder weather, um, that's, why, that's why it's starting to spike and it's starting to come back. We are also in cold and flu season and uh, people are starting to get regular colds and flus and it's getting difficult to tell one from the other. Uh, people are having to self-quarantine. Quarantine, and my, my general advice is be sure to get a flu shot. That's, uh, that's for one, because that will help you get, uh, you know, protect you from getting the common flu. But also, uh, don't let up in your social distancing, your mask wearing, your uh, hand washing, all of which are important in slowing the spread of the virus. There are other graphs that we get from this uh, company that monitors, uh, monitors this for Harrisburg, and, and one of them shows the, the difference in the concentration between Harrisburg and the other uh, municipalities and cities throughout the country. I think there are 400 that uh, are currently having their wastewater monitored, and we are, we are well above the curve on that one as well. If you, if you look at our concentration, it is significantly higher than others. So we have an issue here. It's very real. I thought the graph would be helpful to show you this morning. We'll continue to monitor it, um, and people need to be careful. And this is one of the reasons that we uh, canceled this year the standard, traditional door-to-door -door trick or treat, and we replaced it with uh, with something we're calling a grab and go a trick or treat night, which is happening at all three of the fire stations now. Because of the rain yesterday, we decided we'd have it on the actual Halloween, which is coming up here this Saturday, October 31st, obviously. And there you can see the three fire stations. Uh, remember those addresses. The Uptown one is on North 6th Street, right near the Red Cross. Then you have the one uh, in Allison Hill at 140 North 16th Street, right there near the uh, uh, near the Har uh, Harrisburg School District Administration Building. And then the one that's over on 13th and Howard Street. Um, all three of those uh, stations are gonna be uh, uh, populated by firefighters and city council members and myself. And I can tell you, we packed uh, over a thousand bags of candy to go uh, at each of those. And I wanna again thank our sponsors, especially Hershey Foods. They gave us uh, an entire pallet of candy for the youth of this city, uh, but also Giant, which was extremely generous, uh, Wegmans, uh, Carnes, and uh, indeed the Downtown Improvement District uh, all pitched in and uh, have allowed us to really put together what will be a fun treat night. So come in your scariest masks, masks are required, the scarier the better, 
and uh, pick up uh, pick up some candy. And we're going to have firefighters there helping us social distance. We're going to have cones out. It's going to be a safe and uh, positive way to experience Halloween. And I think that uh, the weather's supposed to be very nice for Saturday night. There's also no prohibition on going to more than one fire station. So if uh, an entire bag of candy is not enough, you can, uh, you can drive and go over to a, a, a second station and uh, enjoy yourselves and say hi to additional people, people there. So that is Grab and Go Treat Night. That's happening this Saturday. In terms of other announcements, I wanted to remind everyone that uh, we're going to be having a reverse holiday parade in November, another uh, interesting adaptation here amidst coronavirus. That's coming up on Saturday, November 21st at 10 a.m. to noon on City Island. Still plenty of time to plan for that, but I will, I will tell you we had so much candy that uh, there will probably be extra candy for all the participants who come to the reverse holiday parade on November 21st. And what's a reverse holiday parade? If, you, if, you're, if you're not sure, you should come experience it. But basically, the parade participants stay put, and you get to drive through the parade in your vehicle and enjoy uh, seeing all that they have to offer. That's going to be fun. This coming week, uh, as a reminder, it, uh, there is no city council meeting uh, because Tuesday is election day, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But uh, no city council meeting this week. Next week, they are going to have both a work session and a legislative session back to back on Tuesday the 10th. And I believe they are planning to vote on the uh, police uh, oversight board bill. And uh, they, they'll entertain entertainments one last or amendments one last time in the uh, work session there on November 10th. So mark your calendar for that. Um, and uh, don't forget this weekend is daylight savings time. It's that time of year again. So in the early hours of the morning on Sunday, we're going to uh, roll uh, back our clocks an hour. It's going to be hard, but we can do it. And uh, and then that's a reminder as well to check your smoke alarm batteries. Last week we talked about fire safety prevention month and we reminded everyone that if you don't have working smoke alarms you can have one installed for free by the fire department just call the city <coughs> excuse me you can call 311 and we'll uh, we'll hook you up there uh, but if you do have working fire alarms check your batteries and uh, make sure the batteries are working the new ones that they come to your house and install these days last over a decade they've got the high-powered lithium batteries so uh, if you need smoke alarms we will provide them uh, to you free of charge and we'll even come advise you on where the best placement is in your home finally i wanted to take a minute to encourage everyone to get out and vote this coming uh, tuesday I'm wearing my I Voted Early sticker, which uh, maybe you can see in the camera, but that's because uh, I did vote early, and a lot of people have voted early. In fact, tens of thousands of people here in Dauphin County have voted early. Um, if you uh, requested a vote-by-mail ballot, then um, uh, we are recommending at this point that you not put that ballot in the mail. And the reason is because uh, mail times are averaging, at least uh, based on uh, uh, City Hall and the amount of mail that we receive from within the city, four, five, six, seven, sometimes even over a week to arrive, even mail that's, uh, that's going uh, from one point in the city to another. We actually had a couple days last week where no mail arrived at all at City Hall. And this is some of the uh, things that we've been reporting. And uh, uh, back to the post office, Penn Lai has been doing a number of articles on this. There are significant postal delays. And while I'm confident your ballot will eventually arrive, I'm not confident if you were to mail your ballot uh, today, it would arrive in time for uh, it to be uh, counted on Tuesday. And that's why we're encouraging people to use the uh, drop box, which is located right in downtown Harrisburg at the County Administration Building. It's at Second and Market. If you haven't uh, been there before, there's a little box. You don't actually have to go in the building. And any time during the day, up until 8 p.m. at night, you can drop that ballot off. You can also go in the building if you'd like. Uh, you do have to pass through a metal detector, but you can hand the uh, actual uh, uh, ballot to uh, an election official if you're more comfortable doing it that way. Uh, that's what I did. It worked well, and then they'll send you a confirmation email that says, uh, congratulations, we've received your ballot. And uh, that can give you a little bit of peace of, peace of mind. Um, one question which I, I wanted to talk to everyone about, which I've been getting a lot, is uh, what happens if I requested a mail-in ballot, but now I'm thinking I really do want to go actually vote in person on Tuesday? And the answer is, 
you can do that. Uh, it is allowed, um, and this is what you should do. You need to bring the ballot that you received in the mail and haven't uh, actually filled out or, or, or voted with. You need to bring that ballot with you to your precinct. When you arrive at the precinct, you can say, I requested this mail-in ballot, but I didn't use it, and I've decided I want to vote in person. You would then hand that ballot to uh, the election poll workers there, and they will put it in a special area for spoiled ballots, and they will let you cast your uh, your vote, and your vote will be tabulated and counted right there um, uh, as uh, uh, instead of having uh, done it by mail. Uh, they want you not only to bring your ballot with you, but also there's an envelope that you're supposed to put that mail-in ballot in that has a, uh, a code on it, a little uh, scannable code. You need to bring all the material with it. So just bring, bring your entire packet of material, and they will, um, they, will, they will cancel that and allow you to vote. If you don't have that, uh, if you requested one by mail, but let's say you've lost it or you don't know where it is, but you haven't voted, you can still go to your precinct and vote. In that instance, uh, you're going to have to say, I don't have my ballot. I requested one by mail. I don't have it. And they're going, to, uh, they're going to let you, at that point, cast what's called a provisional ballot. And a provisional ballot uh, is, is very much like a, a regular ballot, other than the fact that it won't be counted that day. It will go in a, a separate uh, pool of votes, which will then get counted by the judge of elections at a, a later time, probably at the same time as they're tabulating other types of uh, write-in votes uh, and things like that. So if you want your vote counted on election day, and you've gone to the polls uh, to have that happen, uh, and uh, and you and you you originally requested that mail-in ballot. Be sure to bring it with you, and that will ensure that your vote will be counted, and it won't be a provisional ballot. I hope that is all very clear to folks. There are lots of ways to vote. I hope everybody will vote, and I hope that we will shatter all of our records for voting uh, here in Dauphin County. It looks like there's a good possibility of that, and it also looks like the percentages are going to be relatively high for us, which is uh, which is good news for democracy. So um, remember to vote, and Election Day, of course, is Tuesday, although it's going to take a long time uh, to count all these votes, especially all those mail-in votes. They haven't been able to count them in advance, and uh, as a result, uh, the counting is going to go on uh, into the evening and the following days, and uh, uh, it's not going to be entirely clear if we're going to know a winner here in Pennsylvania on Election Night. But please get out and vote, and we will, uh, we will see see where we are, and uh, uh, I encourage everyone to do so. So now on to the main discussion. We are going to discuss youth programming in the city of Harrisburg. And uh, let's begin with Amy Rote. Amy, as I said, was the interim CEO, and she's the vice president of programming for Big Brothers and Big Sisters of the Capital Region. And Amy, I've got a bunch of questions for you, but let's, let's just start with What's the mission of Big Brothers and Big Sisters of the Capital Region? Tell, uh, tell our audience a little bit about what you do. Okay, so Big Brothers, Big Sisters of the Capital Region, our mission is to create and support one-to-one -one mentoring relationships that ignite the power and promise of youth. I am so uh, happy to be part of this discussion today because as a part of uh, being a leader for a youth serving organization, it is really a time for all of us to come together um, to be supportive and be bigger together in helping support our young people. Uh, what we do, we compatibly match our, our youth, we call them littles, uh, with volunteers, bigs, um, in mentoring relationships that foster friendships, guidance, support, just to navigate everyday life challenges. Uh, we actually pair young people uh, age 7 uh, to 17. Uh, however, we support those match relationships uh, until 21 years of age. So that means no matter if you get matched when you're 7 and uh, you're matched 1, 5, 10 years, our agency is there offering training, support, resources to the families, uh, just ensuring that we're collaboratively working together to defend the potential of our, our young people. Yes. Now, those relationships are so important, and uh, they can form bonds that uh, that can last last a lifetime and really uh, affect a, a, a youth's trajectory uh, in life. Um, but oftentimes that's done in person, and it's done through uh, a lot of uh, many, many hours of, of, of intensive uh, in-person work. So, so how has coronavirus, specifically, you know, this strange climate that we're in in 2020, affected your organization and your ability to uh, establish these relationships? 
Well, for Big Brothers Big Sisters, we really never um, missed a beat. Back in March in 2020, uh, we immediately came together, communicating with our bigs, uh, fa our families, our youth on uh, safety measures, CDC guidelines, and transitioning all of our in-person mentoring opportunities to a virtual platform. We are actually very fortunate through our Big Brothers Big Sisters of America. We have an, our own app, which provides secure and safe messages between the big, the little, uh, the match support coach, and the guardian. So this uh, app is a great virtual um, method to keep us all linked together. And it's not only linking uh, the mentor to be able there to support the child and their um, emotional needs, their academic needs, but it's also uh, linking us to the, um, the parent so that us as an organization can ensure we're giving resources to the families, um, whether it's financial support, uh, whether it's resources for and referrals to therapists um, for mental health counseling, any needs that the family may be going through, this app allows us to do so. All of our community-based programs, all of our school-based programs currently in this school year are utilizing a virtual platform through um, various different methods, uh, Zoom multiple times a month, bringing our bigs, littles, and uh, our professionals and our school systems together to support our young people. Wow. So there is an app for that, which is, uh, which is impressive. <laughs> That's that is that is good to know. Now I know that um, uh, everybody's getting used to this uh, virtual uh, world. We, we we've had to, but especially in Harrisburg, uh, there have been issues of uh, access to uh, Wi-Fi and uh, the internet. Uh, I know the school district itself has uh, struggled mightily in terms of uh, making sure that uh, it could reach into every home. Are you, are you finding uh, challenges there in connecting uh, everyone and uh, if? If so, how are you addressing that? Well, we definitely have a difficulty connecting if there's not um, any type of service in the home. However, you know, most of our mentors are able to um, share that need with us and we're able to get them connected either in person with following CDC guidelines and safety measures or um, making sure that we link them with resources to be able to get that free internet services. Uh, you know, our counselors that we work with in our school programs are reaching out uh, to assist families. Uh, we have our bigs. <laughs> I have so many of our volunteers saying they're becoming experts in math <laughs> because they're providing academic support that they never did before, but our, our kids need that support. So whether it's uh, through uh, in-person uh, in safety uh, distancing or whether utilizing the resources of our bigs or the agency, we're able to keep our kids connected. That's great. And uh, I'm sure everyone uh, is working hard. And there are resources which do exist for, uh, for free Wi-Fi, free internet in the home. Uh, so if, uh, if a part of what you're doing is helping get people connected, then that, that's great because that will help in all aspects, not just uh, in the mentorship but relationship with big brothers, big sisters. Um, let's, let's have a serious uh, uh, conversation about uh, institutional racism and, and how that affects the sort of mentor-mentee um, uh, relationship and, and some of the challenges that maybe um, your organization has faced in overcoming those hurdles. Well, you know, it really comes down to education and wanting and uh, seeking out uh, the resources that we have for the organization nationally and locally. Big Brothers Big Sisters has made a commitment to DEI. Um, most recent uh, training education conversation is really placing um, the justice around DEI, which changing the acronym to JEDI. But we are a tra uh, trauma-informed care agency. We recognize uh, the trauma that our families, our kids are having related to discrimination and bias and microaggressions. What we do as an organization is we move forward intentionally in our programming to ensure that we put services, training, supports in place so that type of uh, trauma does not cause long-term psychological impact. Uh, back in 2017, Amer, we made an intentional effort uh, to bring our national program, Bigs and Blue, uh, to the community. And that was in a direct response to Ferguson. We, we wanted to, um, this program is a national Big Brother 
Big Sisters program that bridges the gap between law enforcement and our young young people by helping our young people see the person behind the uniform. And on the other end, it helps the person in the uniform understand the challenges and the discrimination and the, the youth adversities that are happening in the communities that they serve. So it's a great program. We actually have the second largest Bigs and Blue uh, program in the country now with 13 police departments involved in the capital region uh, and in surrounding areas and the Pennsylvania State Police mentoring youth. So we are a mission focused one-to-one -one, uh, agency, but we look to make sure that we are creating programming very customized to ensure that we are, are making an impact and educating and being out there creating conversations to make change. That's great. That's It's really important. Uh, I know on a, a personal level, uh, my, my daughter who is uh, uh, a freshman in college, although uh, it, it's all virtual now, uh, she's been involved in uh, tutoring in the Philadelphia uh, school district area through her uh, through her college, and uh, one of the things that they've really looked at uh, closely uh, is uh, Im implicit biases and other uh, other other techniques for uh, for tutoring and, and bridging the sort of racial divide and racial gap. Do you, what what sort of resources do you have for your uh, mentors, uh, if if somebody's watching this and saying, "I'd like to get involved, and uh, I'd like to, you know, become a mentor for Big Brothers Big Sisters," but I, I'm, you know, I'm not sure about how I bridge those types of uh, cultural divides. I'd like to. What 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 um, what, what do you offer? Well, what we do is we begin the conversation immediately when they come in to enroll as a big. We talk about a life experiences. We talk about their own personal beliefs and values and biases. And through that interview process, we're able to really gauge, uh, you know, what types of education and training that volunteer will need to work with uh, a youth that's from a, a different culture or different background. From there, we provide uh, training, pre-match training, training throughout the year, uh, resources, uh, educational uh, webinars and uh, TED Talks and different things. Uh, as far as the organization, it's about creating the conversation and being there to support that big uh, throughout the entire time that they're with their, their littles to be able to see different perspectives. Uh, one program that we just launched here in 2020 and really look forward to expanding in 2021 is a collaborative program with uh, the Harrisburg Regional Chamber and the Whitaker Center uh, called Rise Up, Stand Together. And that whole program uh, came in response to wanting to be bigger together and bridge the gap for young people of color in the capital region. Uh, we came together to say, hey, we have amazing resources between our organizations and network. How can we really make a change? We had our first virtual series a couple weeks ago with a special guest, um, Ron Yaman, from a, a, a financial advisor from Morgan Stanley, a great guest speaker that was able to talk to young uh, teenagers in Harrisburg City School District about uh, how he overcame uh, challenges related to systemic racism and what it took for him to uh, you know, really get to the, the leadership and the professional uh, career that he's at. Uh, our goal in this collaboration is to continue to extend, expand this program beyond virtual, bring great opportunities through mentorship for our young people uh, in Capital Region, just to really uh, start uh, bridging that gap, especially in technology and opportunity. Great. Well, thank you for that work and for uh, working on these partnerships and uh, for your focusing on, on bridging the gap. Do you want to talk a little bit about, I know you have a growing workforce development program and uh, uh, focus on getting people job and career ready is is is, is, is very important. And uh, part of our, our goal here today is to let people know how they can get involved. Maybe there's some in the corporate community that would like to support such an endeavor. So what are you doing and how can people get involved? Absolutely. I, we, we started recognizing our, our mentors were coming to us a lot to say, hey, I've been with my little since I was seven, eight years old. Uh, I want now they're in middle school, high school. I want to help them discover careers and know what to do. So we started recognizing that workforce development uh, was really an area that we could make an impact on. Uh, and 
we started our Beyond School Walls mentoring program with Capital Blue Cross. And that program uh, has really grown. They've been together for four years. Our mentors uh, meet with their littles twice a month. And the littles primarily were from Harrisburg School District. And they build that friendship with their mentor while going through a curriculum uh, of soft skills, job readiness skills to get ready for the workforce. Uh, this program has been so successful. We've actually launched down in uh, Lebanon uh, at Jonestown Bank and Trust. We were in Lancaster. And uh, currently, this November, we are launching in uh, Harrisburg or in Dolphin County with Susquehanna Township. Uh, we'll be having students go into Mid Penn Bank initially, virtually, uh, twice a month. And then we're also working with Deloitte over in Cumberland County with uh, uh, Cumberland Valley School District. So the intent of the program is to not only bring our young people uh, together with a mentor uh, to have to help navigate their academic years, but to develop the soft skills necessary for them to be successful in the future. Okay, great. Well, so just a, in, in a final summary, though, uh, how can the community and how can uh, uh, both the local community and the local business community get involved and support Big Brothers Big Sisters? Well, you know, this this has been a tough year uh, for everyone, 2020, especially nonprofits. Uh, you know, I think for us, you know, and, and many other, we've lost a lot of our funds related to our annual fundraising events not being able to be held. So, you know, if... I, I, we ask if there's a, a way for financial uh, donation to help support our mission. Uh, we do greatly appreciate uh, advocacy uh, for mentorship. Uh, most important, just visit our website at www.catbigs.org and, and look and, and find out about all the different programs that we have available for you to get involved with. with. Right now, it is a great time to become a mentor. Our virtual platform just offers everyone an opportunity to do it at their own time and own pace and this is a time where our kids really do need us to step up and provide some additional support uh, so that they can learn to be resilient and be able to overcome the challenges that they're facing right now great okay. I greatly appreciate being here and being a part of such a great uh, panel of community youth leaders Okay, well, okay. thank you very much, and stick around because we may have some uh, questions from viewers here for you at the end. But I think you bring up a really good point, which is not only uh, do we need this type of uh, mentorship uh, relationship more than ever now, but maybe, just maybe, uh, it's it's going to be a little easier for people given uh, the technology and the ability to be able to make a difference in people's lives uh, uh, from without having to leave your own home or having a, a flexible schedule. And that is one of, uh, one of the things which has emerged from this pandemic, which is sort of changing how we all interact, which which does have some positive uh, some positive points and some positive um, uh, things that we can build on, especially for organizations like yours. So, thanks thanks for that summary. We're going to go now to uh, Jamian Jamian Harvey, Executive Director at the Camp Curtin YMCA, where I suspect you are as we speak. Um, Jamian, let's start in the same way, which is uh, just give us a give people who maybe are watching, maybe they don't know, maybe they do know, but give us an overview of what the Camp Curtin uh, YMCA does and maybe, you know, how it uh, has a, a, a sort of special place within the larger uh, YMCA community uh, throughout Dauphin County. Sounds good. Thanks for having me, Mayor. Yep. Yep. Um, Camp Curtin YMCA is what it is. I mean, I have it on my shirt. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Cornerstone Academy, Cornerstone of this community, Cornerstone of Uptown Harrisburg, for long before me and long after me, um, we do a little bit of everything. You know, we're 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 vastly becoming a well-rounded, you know, social service organization um, beyond youth. You know, just really meeting the needs of you know the community. So you know, we're doing everything from affordable housing to uh, you know workforce development to uh, uh, we're also a trauma-informed you know. Uh, uh, organization and also training the trauma informed. So, um, we, you know, we're just, you know, we're just in the fight doing whatever is what's needed. You know, our mission may change, you know, from year to year. It stays the same. But again, we we definitely look to meet the needs of the community. Whatever those needs are, you know, we're standing by and, you know, we're ready to uh, perform. 
Yeah, that's terrific. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, how you, you've uh, expanded and adapted and, and have a really uh, amazing vision for how to address those those needs of the community. But uh, part of our focus today is how uh, COVID and the pandemic has really affected um, youth uh, oriented organizations. So so how has it uh, how has it impacted what you do at the Y? Honestly, what it's impacted is it's allowed my staff and myself to be more innovative. You know, I think it's, you know, created some creative juices, you know, within myself and and, and my staff. Um, it, it really allowed us to, you know, kind of think outside of the box. I mean, the pandemic is the pandemic, but I always try to find some good in everything. And, you know, the good piece in everything is, like I said, I mean, it was time to you know change it was time to move it was time to go i mean those were things that you know kind of need to take place anyway but it was just really allowed us to you know come up with innovative ways to you know work with our youth you know? so i would just say that it just kicked us in the high gear even hmm. faster hmm. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does yeah. force you to focus on uh, what's what's really important and how do you uh, deliver uh, the, d deliver that even even in a challenging time. So let's talk specifically, though. So um, have you been able to maintain in person programming? And if so, uh, what are, what are you doing and how are you making it work? And as a corollary to that, how have you embraced uh, the new technology? So we've been doing a lot of in person programming, honestly. Um, we were still able to ho hold our STEM educational camp, you know, this summer um, for about 50 to 60 youth. Um, we do have a large facility, of course, a full gym and, you know, several classrooms. So we're able to, you know, spread out our youth, you know, um, and, and social distance, you know, really well. Um, our building is really controlled and structured. So being able to do that has been great. So um, we have our Cornerstone Academy program that we're running right now for K-12. Um, that's all the Harrisburg School District. That's all the surrounding school districts. Um, so with the K-12 Cornerstone Academy program, that's our virtual academy. Students can come here, access Wi-Fi, um, tablets, computers, whatever they need um, to uh, work throughout their school day. So along with that, they also have tutors that make sure, you know, that they stay on schedule and also if they need any help, you know, throughout their school day. We also provide lunch, breakfast, you know, snacks, you know, for the kids. And, you know, that's from eight to five every day. Um, there was just a huge need for a lot of parents who were going back to work um, that needed, you know, child care for the youth. But even myself, you know, I had my son here trying to um, do his online schooling, you know, while he was sitting right across from me. Me making sure that, you know, he's on his Zooms on time or, you know, he's, he's turning in his work like he needs to be. It was it was tough. You know, it's tough for me. It's been tough for the community. So we stepped in. And like I said, we we have a uh, staff who, who, who make sure that the kids are on time on their Zoom, make sure that they get their work done. And they also communicate with the teachers about anything that the, the youth may be lacking in. So that's the Cornerstone Academy. We also have our juvenile adjudicated youth program here in the building also. That's in partnership with Dauphin County. These are things that just didn't stop. Again, they went virtually for a while, but we brought them back into the building in person. So those are just some of the in-person programming, you know, that we're actually doing right now. Great, thank you. Uh, the let's go. Uh, let's focus on the Cornerstone Academy for a minute because I think that's so uh, so needed, especially uh, in this uh, uh, online uh, environment. And it does look like the Harrisburg School District's probably not going to return to any type of uh, in-person learning this year, at least certainly not as we're seeing the the spikes and the increases that we're we're currently seeing. So, um, how many how many kids do you have in, in the Cornerstone Academy? Um, if people are watching and they'd really love to get their own uh, uh, kid in, involved in this, is there still the ability? Is there still room? Um, and if people are watching and they'd like to help out and 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 maybe be a tutor or or um, you know uh, just do do you need do you need volunteers? Yes, we definitely need volunteers, and we still do have space open, you know, for the uh, Cornerstone Academy. Again, right now we have about thirty five students, and that's mm. 
some of the classes have like five to six, you know, uh, youth per class. Again, we're also utilizing our gym. We're also utilizing our stage. So we have capacity probably for about 120 youth um, before we would, you know, be probably in a critical situation in regards to the social distancing. But I mean, you can definitely go on the, uh, you know, Harrisburg YMCA website and uh, register. You can also come in and register. Um, you know, the program is run for a minimal fee, but we also do have financial aid um, from a lot of our different sponsors. And, you know, if anybody wants to donate you know, to, you know, the Cornerstone Academy, or any other programming that we do, um, we are an educational tax credit organization, you know, so businesses do give the Camp Curtin YMCA funding, you know, based on uh, tax credits and the programming that we do. Um, but, you know, right now, as, as everyone has continued to say, you know, uh, financially, we, we need all the help that we can get. But, you know, um, you know, shows like this and, you know, having these conversations with you, Mayor, allows us to, you know, continue to get our, our, um, our information out. That's, uh, that, that's terrific. Thank you. And uh, one, one thing we've talked about a little bit in the past was um, uh, your affordable housing vision as well for, for the community. And I think it would be good to give uh, folks an update on that. Uh, it's unusual, although not unheard of, for an organization like yours to, to sort of uh, think about uh, the, the uh, things like affordable housing and its need in the larger community and look to uh, transform uh, an, entire, an entire neighborhood um, and uh, do it in physical ways as well as uh, in mentoring ways. So uh, what's the status of, uh, of your plans? I know uh, there's, uh, the, there's been a lot of approvals, but I wonder if COVID has uh, slowed anything or, or changed any timelines. Well, COVID has changed some timelines for us. Um, you know, we definitely wanted to get our four affordable houses built this uh, spring, this past spring. But, you know, we've actually moved into 2021, you know, for our first affordable uh, housing project where, like I said, we're creating home ownerships for uh, uh, four new homeowners. Um, again, when, you're, when you talk about meeting a need, you know, I, I walk this neighborhood every day, you know, along with our children. I walk this neighborhood and, you know, the way this neighborhood looks is, is very unacceptable to me and it's unacceptable to our children. So, um, you know, being a leader that, that, that I feel that we try to be here, we're going to meet the need. There's a bunch of blighted properties. There's a bunch of open land. You know, we've taken time to study with some of our other YMCAs that, you know, are doing the same thing in regards to affordable housing. York YMCA right down the road is which is considered our big brother, you know, in this process, you know, has shown us the way and we want to, um, you know, develop and take back our community, you know, but also to be able to, uh, you know, partner those families, you know, with the with the cornerstone here and having all of the social services and, you know, child care and programs that they need, you know, to be able to build a strong community. So, you know, that's where that came from. And, you know, we're looking forward to, you know, throwing that shovel on the ground, you know, in the spring 2021. It's a project that we've been working on for a really long time and, um, you know, um, be really excited to see that happen. Yeah, well, speaking for the city, we can't wait. Uh, it's definitely uh, much needed, and it's gonna it's gonna transform the whole area around the Y. Uh, and uh, uh, we're we're looking at a number of initiatives that we can do citywide. Uh, some of which are going to be introduced in November here, before the end of the year. Various incentives for affordable housing, but you're doing exactly uh, exactly what we want to see. So back to the programming in the Cornerstone Academy. One question uh, people may have is, um, how are you, you have a large facility and you're dealing with a, with a lot of use. How are you um, uh, keeping it uh, safe and clean and uh, uh, able to be utilized day in and day out? And what, what sort of challenges uh, have you faced in, in creating a, a, a program to, you know, to keep the environment safe amidst the pandemic? Well, again, we have a lot of structure built in here. Um, having a National YMCA Association has allowed us to, you know, look at what all of the YMCAs have done in regards to um, coming up with a plan for our branch. Um, our branch here, we have several Fogger machines um, where the uh, classrooms and uh, areas of the Y are cleaned daily. Um, 
So, you know, that's just one of the pieces that, you know, we, we built in. We have six or seven maintenance guys that are just going around cleaning around the clock. But, you know, the uh, Clorox fogger machines, you know, really come in handy. Um, you know, they were a little pricey on the front end, but, you know, a lot of good sponsors stepped up and came through for us to uh, be able to purchase, you know, those fogger machines. So anytime kids, you know, move any in any type of way within the building, you know, we're, we're fogging and keeping, you know, our facility clean clean as possible. And with that, that's almost a segue into a program that we just created. It's a workforce development program called the Colby Cleaning Court. So for 18 to 24 year olds, we created a workforce development program with um, Clean for a Dream, um, where they'll receive certifications to actually learn to clean um, COVID cleaning. There's a big difference between regular cleaning and COVID cleaning, where they'll actually get, you know, a national certification to become uh, COVID cleaners. They'll also receive a $750 stipend to, you know, start their own businesses. During that time of the five weeks that they're in the program, you know, they'll be learning marketing, they'll leave with their own websites, they'll leave with their own business cards. But I mean, these are 18 to 24 year olds that we're throwing right into the workforce. Um, they'll be working for cleaning for a dream. You know, we're looking at other small nonprofits in the area that may not be able to afford the, you know, the fogging machines. But um, we're looking again to, to thrust these 18 to 24 year olds right into, you know, the workforce. And this is a certification that is honestly um, unheard of, you know, for, for you, for, for teens or adults 18 to 24. Any other uh, uh, things you'd like to uh, leave us with here this morning? Uh, yes, we are providing meals Monday through Friday at 9 a.m. breakfast and 1 o'clock for lunch for any teens or any kids that um, in the community, no cost, no paperwork. Like, again, that's Monday through Friday, um, hot breakfasts, hot lunches, you know, um, you can just come right up to the building. It's all grab and go, you know, again, like I said, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. breakfast, one o'clock lunch. Um, you can pick up for your children. Your children don't have to be with you. Um, you can pick up for other children. You can pick up for the neighbors. Um, you can take as many meals as you like. Um, again, so let's just make sure we utilize that because, you know, definitely here again for the community almost. 500 to 1,000 uh, breakfasts and lunches a day. My goodness, thank you for doing that. That's really important and uh, good to know that uh, hot breakfast, among other things, is uh, available at the Camp Curtain Wine. So thank, thank you, Jamie, for your time today. And we are going to go um, finally here today for this conversation, at least, to Patricia Robinson, who is the CEO of Evolve Training and Development, LLC. And uh, Patricia, uh, let's uh, let's introduce our viewers, uh, if they don't know about it already, to Evolve. Um, give us a little bit of background about your organization as well as yourself, please. First of all, I'd like to thank you for having me on today. Um, it's truly um, a, a pleasure to be able to speak to the community and um, speak to our program um, mm -hmm. of Evolve Training and Development. Evolve Training and, and Development is a, a training program basically for personal and professional growth. Uh, we train on the level of entrepreneurship, communication skills, self-image, and of course, financial literacy. Um, that was the start of the business and it has since grown into what we're gonna be talking about today. What we have been talking about today is youth and how we can improve our workforce, uh, really focusing on our youth and our community. Yeah, that's great. So uh, I know that uh, uh, for for you, it is uh, it's really a focus on um, uh, what what might traditionally have been called vocational training, but uh, is now really more of a, a focus on career and technical education. So let, let's talk a little bit about uh, about that focus and why that's important. Okay. Well, just going back a little bit, um, we have since um, really directed our focus to the youth. Mm -hmm. And so we are now uh, have um, taken on the responsibility of training our youth in the areas of trades and the trades uh, meaning um, carpentry, plumbing, plumbing, electrical, graphic design, and working into getting into HVAC as well. Um, one of the reasons why I, I decided to get into the trades is because I was a, a substitute teacher for seven years in the Central Dolphin School District. And that afforded me the opportunity to really engage with the students um, 
one on one and to find out what their really what their goals are and what their aspirations was. And one of the things where they lack motivation, they, they lack inspiration in terms of what were their next steps, what was the next, um, what was their next in life. And so finding that there's a huge dropout rate, um, especially um, going into the high school, we had students talking about dropping out as early as in middle school. And so with that being said, we have to, I had to redirect my attention to what is the need, what is the demand in our community? What, what are we lacking? And we're lacking the skills. Um, and that could be from uh, just thinking about their ability to do something versus their ability not to do something. So just focusing on what they can do with their hands. And that really pushed me to think about the trades. Um, the reason why um, I decided to, to focus on the youth is because of their, their lack of not wanting to do something. So when we think about the trades, it's been it's, it's looked at as one of the lowest, sometimes we get that negativity that is one of the lowest jobs that you can get. And we want to change that conversation. And that's why I think they reverted back from just changing it to a vocational, where now we're hearing career uh, and educational uh, pathways. So with that being said, it's, it's giving a new face to the trades and allowing students to take a ne another look at what, it, what they can do with their hands and also having a sustainable career that is not the last option, but the first opportunity. That's great. That's really important, and uh, I can say, if, you know, from the city standpoint, we have uh, we have really great career paths uh, in a variety of things. Everything from uh, auto mechanics to uh, uh, maintenance workers to to you name it. All of which are focused on uh, on working in various trades with your hands. These are uh, good paying jobs, family sustaining jobs, jobs that uh, come with a pension and benefits, and uh, they might be a good fit for folks. So, so the question is, how do we establish that uh, pipeline? Of, 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 of people, and we, we want to start young with our youth. So what, what is it um, exactly that uh, Evolve then does to, to help uh, prepare our youth for these uh, types of uh, opportunities? Well, what we've been doing is started out doing a summer program where we um, work with youth between the ages of 12 and 18. I've gotten calls for parents that want them to start as early as 9 and 10. Um, but we started a six six to week eight six to eight week program, which allows students to get a hands on, almost like an introductory to the trade. So we will allow them to work one or two weeks on carpentry, another week on um, plumbing, another week on electricity, and then graphic designs. We will also encompass all those trades into one end of the year project, as long as the kids stay within that um, within that that six week program. Um, stick and say they were able to build something that from their hands and actually have something to show for. So with that being said, we started the six week program and now we've moved into um, the high school. We're currently in Stilton High Spire where we're training the schools, uh, I'm sorry, the students from the ages of seventh grade to um, high to um, 12th grade on the, on the different trades, starting with carpentry. Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, it has allowed us to, it has, uh, we have had to op we have had to stop the trades um, for time being until we had to resume. Hopefully, we will be resuming back in November to be able to train those students on the trades. How has uh, how has the pandemic really impacted your ability to do that type of one-on-one uh, -on -one training? Especially, I would think in uh, uh, a uh, you know vocational or trade environment, there's there's going to be need for hands-on learning. It's not necessarily something that translates well to uh, virtual learning, but maybe that's not the case. So, uh, can you talk a little bit about how you've adapted to um, uh, to, to life uh, uh, within the pandemic? Sure. Um, well, uh, again, um, it has affected us um, mm -hmm. severely, but starting, we just started back into the trades. We started our, our six week program. Actually, we started in September and we were there. We we're keeping, keeping it small. We had five students, five to five to eight students in our program practicing social distancing. Um, mm -hmm. We partnership with the neighborhood um, neighborhood center uptown who is led by um, Gary Fallings. Mm -hmm. So we had the opportunity to go in there and, and start our trades program again with parents that was comfortable with allowing their students to participate. And we've had some great reports in that. We haven't had any incidents. So we're on our third class. 
um, with the trade, with the trades, with the students. And this is also allowing the school to see that this is, it's, it's, it's possible. So what we're going to be doing with Stilton High Spire, we're going to be doing virtual um, training, which will be basically their, their knowledge, their skills in terms of the book work. And then we will be going in on those days that they are allowing the, the students to go in and do the hands on um, with them. So they'll be able to get that experience as well. Okay, that's okay, great. That's so you're great. right in the heart of it uh, at the neighborhood center right now. You're in the midst of the uh, of the course. So what? Um, how, how has the feedback been from the students that are currently involved, and uh, what sort of skills are they learning? Talk talk, talk a little bit about um, uh, their experiences in, in uh, within the course. I really can't speak for them, but I can say what they have shown mm -hmm. me in terms of um, their attitude and their eagerness to learn. Uh, we are in um, the neighborhood center twice a week, which is Tuesdays and Thursdays. We had a class last night. And these students, when we're, right now we have five students in that class. They don't even want to leave. They want to, they, uh, they even want to come every day um, to learn the trade. So they are enthusiastic about it. And they are asking those critical questions. You know, what if, you know, how can I do that? What can I do? How can I get more involved with the trades? Unfortunately, in our district, you know, in the Harrisburg School District, they don't have that for those students. So they have to rely on a DC Tech, which all students don't get the opportunity. And that's the reason why I really am pushing trades, because all students are not given the opportunity to learn a trade. Unfortunately, because there's not enough room in these, um, in these other uh, school districts that will allow them to be a part of it. And then secondly, um, there is, there's a merit system, you know, you have to have, there's certain criteria that has to be met for them to even be accepted into a program. So it, it, those students that may have a blemish, may have some hiccups in their report, they're not gonna get the opportunity. And I want this to be affordable and uh, accessible to every child that's interested in this trade because they are our future. And we think about what's, what's building up our community. We need to see more of the black and the brown being on construction sites, being able to be involved so they can earn a living and be able to give back to the community in a way such as building up and not tearing down. So um, so what comes after the program? Do you, do you help, uh, let's say uh, they experience the program, they learn a lot in the program and they uh, have a desire to, uh, you know, to consider this as a career path. Do you help then uh, uh, match these, uh, these, these young people with more experienced uh, uh, construction and builders and other types of firms? Uh, how, what comes after the training? Yes, well, I have a student that's um, working with me now. He's in co-op and he, he is, um, so he goes on construction sites with, I have tradesmen that I work with. They have their own private companies. I've also partnership with the Carpenters Union, uh, partnership with H.B. McClure, I've partnership with Lowe's. Mm -hmm. So there are opportunities for students to have a direct pipeline into a program, a two-year program or an apprenticeship program. Um, the Carpenters Union has offered, if any student come through my program, once they graduate, they will give them, because of course there's a test that has to be taken. So they will give them as if they were veterans, they will give them points on their test to help them get into their two year program. In addition to that, um, Evolve is working to working on a pre-apprenticeship program with the state so that my, organ, my program will be apprenticeship program. So it will be a pipeline directly into an apprenticeship program for these students or if they wanna to go to a Thaddeus Stevens. We also have connections and partner with Thaddeus Stevens on how we can get our students also into their program. Okay, that sounds wonderful and lots of uh, great potential connections uh, to be made there. Okay, so if I'm watching this uh, today and I'm I'm in Harrisburg and I know a youth or I am a youth and I'm I'm uh, this this might be a great opportunity for me. How do I get involved and evolve? I understand that uh, you're uh, you're in the uh, Steelton High Spire School District, which is uh, which is great, but not yet in Harrisburg. Um, do you have other partnerships planned in the future with the neighborhood center? Are you looking to uh, build uh, a relationship with the Harrisburg School District? Yes, I've been in contact with some of the uh, staff at um, Harrisburg School District, and we're trying to set up a meeting now to um, see how we can correlate on um, this opportunity for their students as well. Um, 
my goal is to is to make again make this a, uh, available to all students that that would like to be a part of it. And Harrisburg is a big district, and they're lacking um, the, they're lacking the trades. And we need to make sure that we give our students a, as much opportunity as possible. So if any student or anyone that's listening to this this broadcast, you can find me at Evolve Evolve Youth Evolve Training and Development .com. Also on Facebook, we have I have a Facebook page that um, is a direct connection to me as well. It gives you opportunity to see what we've been doing with our youth. There's video, there's content there that this shares about, and it's also opportunity for you to see some of the students in their their conversation in terms of their experience with the trades. So we had a conversation with Travis Water um, a couple of weeks ago. There's an interview with him and how it is important and how this program has been instrumental for his students in his district. That's great. Uh, we'll look at look to link to some of those resources, and we'll uh, we'll we'll put that out for you. Can you can you tell us um, uh, just in general how can people support your mission? Uh, what what would you what, what's your message to the community? Well, we need we definitely need more tradesmen um, in all of the areas: plumbing, electrical, carpentry, um, and we we want them to be able to have. Uh, the ability to connect with the, the kids. There's nothing, it's okay to have the skill set and, and be the training ability, but they have to connect with the kids. And of course, they have to be willing to take, um, get a background cl um, check clearances um, to make sure that they are, they're capable to work with our students. So we're definitely looking for um, tradesmen to be volunteers, as well as to be on staff. And to be on staff is their, their ability to be available during the day to work with our students in Stilton High Spire and possibly in the Harrisburg School District. Okay, that's, yeah. Also, I'm sorry, but we're also looking for sponsorships. So any organization that is willing to sponsor a student, um, we have we don't turn anyone away. So we, um, we, we take on students because of their, their, their ability and their eagerness to learn. And so we are looking for sponsoring, sponsorship dollars, money to help us support our, our organization. That's great. We'll get that message out, and people should uh, check out your website, uh, check you out on Facebook, and uh, uh, if you're in, if they're interested in volunteering, they should reach out to you or forming a partnership or just contributing uh, to the mission of Evolve Training and Development. So thank you, Patricia, for letting us know more about uh, what you do. And in a moment, I've, I've learned a lot. Uh, I, you know, there is a, a perception that maybe the uh, the impact of coronavirus has been um, overwhelming. But uh, what we're seeing is that uh, our programs, especially those focused on youth, are persevering, they're adapting, they're changing, but they're, they're, they're still out there serving the community day in and day out. Um, and, uh, and, and we need to know that and, and hopefully uh, give them our collective support. Um, despite the technical difficulties, I bet we have a few questions that uh, came in both before and after the break. Yes, Mary, thank you. Uh, first question is for Amy. Uh, Amy, with um, the process of becoming a, a mentor or a big, um, what, what is that process and are there any qualifi qualifications required for that? Qualification to become a big is your dedication uh, to put the time and consistency in to defending the potential of a young person. Um, all the training and everything that you need to know about young per people, stages of development of children, how to support academically, all of that is provided through our organization. Uh, the most important uh, skill that you need is, is your time and your consistency and your dedication. The enrollment process is really easy. We do everything virtually. So we have a digital application that you send back to us. Uh, we will reach out and set up a virtual uh, interview to talk to you about you know, what you're looking to achieve out of the mentoring experience, uh, what your interests are. As we mentioned, we match on compatibility. So we're really looking uh, to ensure that what the family is looking for, for a mentor, for their child, really aligns with uh, your time and what you're looking to give back to a child. Uh, from the, the interview process, we do all certifications for you, background uh, clearances, and then we start the training um, necessary for you to to meet with your little. And again, all of it is through a virtual platform now uh, from beginning to uh, the support and case management. So it's easier than ever right now to be uh, present and support a young person. 
Great, thank you. Uh, next question is for Patricia. What's the most uh, demand that you see? Like, which trade do you, do you see the most need for as far as volunteers and mentors? Carpentry and plumbing. Okay. And um, we have a comment here from Tawanda. Uh, she's reminding everyone uh, about the Cornerstone Academy. Uh, to enroll for that, please stop by the facility at Camp Kern YMCA, and they're located at 2135 North 6th Street. And the email address is ccyprograms at ymcaharrisburg.org. And this is a good opportunity to mention the other websites that were mentioned. Uh, Big Brother, Big Sister, you can find them at uh, capbigs.org. That's C-A-P-B-I-G-S dot org. Uh, YMCA, ymcaharrisburg.org again. Uh, also, Evolve, www.evolvetraininganddevelopment.com. Right, that's it. Okay, Momin. Thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, I want to thank all of my guests uh, today. We had a great show. Really appreciate your sharing and uh, your commitment to the youth of Harrisburg and the region. It is uh, uh, deeply appreciated. Um, we will be back again next week. Uh, if it's Friday at noon, it's time for a community conversation. I thank all of you for watching. Remember, don't forget to vote. Please have your voices heard and vote, uh, if you haven't already, vote upcoming on Election Day this Tuesday. But until, uh, until we meet again next Friday at noon, I'm Mayor Eric Papenfu saying thank you for watching, and I hope everyone stays safe.